Coming up on this week's show, Jay from Joyfully Jay has book recommendations for us. Plus, we preview this week's Coastal Magic Convention. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome, everyone, to episode 177 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Will Knaus. Hi, everybody. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable group of supporters on Patreon. We'll have more information on how you can join them at the end of this show, along with a sneak peek of what we have coming up for you next week, so you'll want to make sure to stay tuned for that. Yeah, good stuff. So we're going to kick off this week's episode uh, with some unfortunate news. Uh, this is unfortunately becoming a habit. Uh, we'd like to note uh, an author's passing. Uh, we recently uh, heard the news that Victor J. Bannis has left us. Um, now, if you don't know who Victor J. Bannis is, uh, he has been called uh, by some the grandfather of the gay paperback boom. Um, I know him primarily as the author of the absolutely wonderful Man from Camp series uh, and the, the series hero Jackie Holmes. Uh, I love these books two pieces, uh, and I think this year might be the year that I go back and reread all of them. Oh, that would be awesome. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about Victor Bannis's life and career, I recommend you check out his autobiography, Spine Intact, Some Creases. Um, I started listening to this audiobook a couple of weeks ago, um, long before I even knew Victor was sick. And um, as you can see, it's a pretty weighty tome. I think the <laughs> audiobook itself is like like over 13 hours. And I'm like maybe roughly like a third of the way through it. And it's really amusing because not only did Victor have a really uh, interesting and colorful life and career, um, the book serves as, you know, not only a biography, but a memoir. And it's really uh, very kind of amusing that um, it's just like sitting down and uh, hearing tales uh, that Victor himself is uh, telling you personally. Each chapter starts out being about one thing and then goes off in several different <laughs> tangents and ends up being about something else entirely. Uh, so if you are interested in knowing more about Victor J. Bannis, I highly recommend checking out um, Spine Intact, Some Creases. Nice. Yes. Uh, and he will indeed be missed. Uh, in other news, uh, some things coming up in, in my writer life this week. Uh, the cover reveal for Netminder, which is the fourth book in the Codename Winger series, will be happening on Wednesday, February 27th, over at Wicked Reads YA Edition. Uh, I'm so happy to be with them to reveal this last cover. Uh, in addition to being able to see that, uh, there'll be an exclusive excerpt there, so you'll get your first look at what's going on inside book four, and there'll be a chance to win some prizes, including some autographed Codename Winger paperbacks. So the link in the show notes will be there as of Wednesday when this comes out, so be sure to check that out. Uh, I have to say that Aaron Anderson, once again, has done a tremendous cover for this book. He has done... He, the work across all four covers just makes me so happy, the way that they all hold together and really stand well as a series, and I'm, I'm super happy that he was able to work on these. Uh, in this fourth book, uh, which is the final book for this series, uh, teenage secret agent Theo Reese is on the run as an old nemesis comes after tactical operational support. And not only is Theo cut off from his agency, but these bad guys also demand his help because they're trying to take over the internet, which, you know, would be pretty darn bad. Uh, the book's also up now for pre-order at Harmony Inc. and Amazon and all the usual outlets ahead of its May 28th published date. Mm -hmm. Something to look forward to. Yeah. We also want to give a quick shout out and a happy hello to everyone <laughs> who experienced the Shimmer event this past week in the UK. Now, Shimmer, for those of you who don't know, is essentially the premier uh, gay fiction book signing that happens in the UK every year. Um, from all of the social media activity, it seems like a good time was had by all. And uh, I don't mind saying I'm a little bit jealous. 
Um, there were some, ex- you know, amazing kick-ass off authors in attendance this year and uh it's even got me thinking uh i might uh, attend sometime in the future that's a big shocker folks (laughs) because i haven't been able to get this one to even think about a european trip so thank you everyone at shimmer who made that even (laughs) enter his brain yeah um some interesting technical news or technological news uh happened this week uh in a brand new way to keep up with latest news from favorite authors uh, Dreamspeeder Press and Reese Ford partnered up to create an Alexa skill. Now, if you've got an Alexa device, you can enable the skill called Reese Ford Casting. Uh, it's available in the Alexa store, and we'll actually have a link to that. And of course, you can also access it on your uh, snazzy Alexa app. Um, but we've also invited Alexa to join us on the show today, and we'll see firsthand how this works. Alexa. Launch the Reese Ford casting skill. Hey, this is Reese Ford, and welcome to my spot on Alexa. Thank you for joining me here, and I hope to keep you up to date with the latest news about blog tours, where I'm at, and what I'm working on. Alexa, stop. About my... So that's just a little sneak peek there of what's possible with this skill. Uh, apparently there's going to be updates, uh, every week or so. And currently there's news on there about the Kai Grayson series, the 415 Inc. series, and some of her other stuff. So if you've got an Alexa, do check that out. Uh, now to wrap up this little news and tidbits (laughs) section of the show, uh, we, along with everyone else in the world, (laughs) just finished watching the Umbrella Academy on Netflix. Now, this is most definitely, we think, a show you should all be watching if you haven't yet given it a try. Um, It's essentially a show about some uh, exceptional people who are adopted and then trained to become superheroes. Uh, And it really... It it takes the superhero concept to a totally new, interesting place. Uh, We loved the series to pieces. Yeah, it has not really been a series before that we've binged it. And I'm like, oh, man, I think we watched that too fast. And I think we did because it was like, oh, man, it's over. It was was exceptional in every single way. So if you have not seen this series yet, because it's certainly been all over social media since its debut earlier this month, do check out the Umbrella Academy on Netflix. High school hockey player, computer whiz, covert agent. Theo Reese's life is split between being a normal teenager and a secret agent who goes by the code name Winger. After years of providing mission support from behind his keyboard, he's thrust into an unexpected world of adventure and danger. In Tracker Hacker, the first book in the Codename Winger series by Jeff Adams, it becomes personal for Theo, as an enemy organization compromises tactical operational support's agent tracker system. Among the missing agents, his father. Theo puts his life on the line to stop the hack and rescue his dad. Diverse Reader says, wow, talk about a wild ride from beginning to end. I could not stop reading. Discover the world of Codename Winger with Tracker Hacker. Available in ebook, paperback, and audiobook, as narrated by John Solo. So, kicking off the book review section this week, I would like to talk about A Lethal Love, which is Stonewall Investigations number two uh, by Max Walker. And I did the audiobook again with uh, Greg Brudeau. Uh, last week, I talked about book one and mentioned that I had already started this book. And it continued to live up to everything I wanted uh, with this series. In this installment of this romantic suspense yarn, uh, Alejandro Santos is a bored detective with Stonewall Investigations, at least until Griffin Banks stumbles into the front door needing some help. Uh, Griffin woke up in a dr- from a drunken stupor to find his roommate murdered. The cops suspect him, and even Griffin can't really be sure he didn't do it. Alejandro takes the case and begins to put together the puzzle of who would want this woman dead. As usual, Max weaves a very intriguing web here as it's revealed that this woman was not all that she seemed to be. Even Griffin believed his friend uh, was a down-on-her-luck actress who had returned from L.A. to New York to kind of put everything back together. But the the truth was quite jaw-dropping and 
it just like blew my mind more than once. Along the way, of course, Alessandro and Griffin get together, become attracted to each other, and it's up to Alessandro to really peel back the layers of hurt that Griffin carries with him. He's the son of a media mogul, and he lost his mom at a young age and then became estranged from his father. He deals with that problem. He's got bipolar disorder and a drinking problem all bundled up together. And he's very happy just spending his days really doing nothing except muting his feelings. But Alessandro gives him a reason to kind of start to get his life put back together again, all the while hoping that the proof comes together to actually clear his name too. Now, all of this plays out as the unicorn killer continues to make their presence known uh, in New York's LGBT community. Uh, and this causes a lot of unease for the detectives at the agency as it becomes clear that the killer is now going after men who are partnered. And that just adds another layer to that. Max continues to really craft super tight mysteries here that leave me wanting to listen far past the time I should stop. He made me late for work twice last week <laughs> <laughs> because I couldn't take the earbuds out. His characters are so compelling and likable. I mean, it's impossible not to root for Griffin to get his happily ever after and for Alessandro to help, you know, get him to the point where he can patch things up with his dad while at the same time, you know, getting this romantic relationship. The broad range of characters are also fantastic. He Max's complete universe is really reflective of New York with characters who have a range of ethnicities and social backgrounds. As I kind of mentioned, the the mystery got me super tense. And more than once, I actually questioned if Griffin had done it or not. And of course, this is ridiculous. It's a romance, and you're not going to get an HEA if somebody actually committed the murder. But Max does his job of sowing just enough seeds to make me wonder how this was all going to turn out in the end. And I was thrilled that I couldn't piece together who the murderer was before we got to the big reveals. And man, were there some reveals here. Whew. In particular, I want to call out Max's writing on Griffin. There are scenes in here where you really get inside uh, Griffin's head really well. And the things that push him to maybe want him to take another drink or that would pull him back down again. And I really like seeing those sides of Griffin uh, surface through this story a lot. I also have to give a big shout out to Greg Brudeau again, who does such a tremendous job of giving voice to Max's world. And in particular, did a really great job here uh, with Griffin and some of his more emotional scenes. Um, I've already gotten into book three. This is probably not a big surprise. A Tangled Truth actually just dropped on audio on February 19th. So guess what? You're going to get another Max Walker interview, <laughs> review in just a few weeks, I'm sure of it. But for now, I highly recommend A Lethal Love by Max Walker. Fantastic. I'm glad that you're enjoying this series. Oh my God, it's so good. <laughs> um, the start to my reading week didn't go quite like I planned. Um, I started two separate books uh, and ended up putting them down. Not because they were necessarily bad. I just, you know, they weren't for me. They weren't, com you know, com compelling enough for me to keep going. Uh, so that was a little bit frustrating. Mm -hmm. The book that I did enjoy reading was Fresh Catch by Kate Canterbury. Now, Fresh Catch is essentially a secret prince story, though instead of a hunky royal or bad boy celebrity on the down low, this story, uh, we have a tech gazillionaire. Um, Cole is a Silicon Valley wonder kid who's been forced to take a leave of absence slash vacation by his new board of directors. Now, he's sailing up the eastern seaboard on a super fancy sailboat when the navigation system goes on the fritz and he floats into the cove of gruff Maine lobsterman Owen. Things don't exactly get off on the right foot for these two, but despite the fact that they're from like two different worlds, they begin to warm up to one another, uh, and it doesn't like hurt that they find each other like wildly attractive. Um, while Cole is waiting for his boat to be repaired, uh, he'll stay in the spare bedroom of Owen's seaside cottage. And since Owen is short a deckhand, they'll work together uh, each day pulling in lobster traps. As they spend more and more time getting to know one another, the sexual tension builds until they end up taking matters into their own hands, so to speak, leading to like like the most scorching hot sex scene I've read in a very long time. Uh, 
it's really interesting because they're each in separate rooms of the cottage with a wall between them and they both uh, shall we say verbally express their need for and desire for one another it was super super oh, hot man. anyway so as the days and weeks pass they continue their sexy summer fling Owen becoming adorably possessive of his new lover and Cole sort of reveling in the simple life of a quaint coastal town. And this is probably my favorite part of the book. It's where the main characters, who are two genuinely nice guys, they end up going on dates and get to know one another. And I know that it sounds like deadly dull as I'm explaining this, <laughs> but I think it's a crucial step that a lot of authors miss. Um, as the characters take the time to fall in love, we fall in love with them and become much more emotionally invested in their happy ending. Mm -hmm. So... They're both in love, and Owen is about to ask Cole to stay with him permanently when he sees a magazine expose in the checkout lane of the supermarket. Uh-oh. He is not just a tech guy from California. He is a mogul who, like, practically invented the entire internet. <laughs> so the confrontation between our lovebirds doesn't go well, and the ensuing black moment is... um. Kind of textbook, sort of like, you know, why didn't you tell me the truth? I tried, but you weren't interested in the truth. That kind of a thing. <laughs> uh, stuff that we've seen a million times before, but because the author has, like, done her job and laid all of the emotional groundwork, we implicitly understand how devastating and truly painful this moment is for our two heroes. And frankly, it's kind of like a punch in the face for the reader, me included. Mm -hmm. I did that... <laughs> It's so lame. I do this thing <laughs> a lot when I'm like super emotionally invested in a book and we get to the black moment towards the end. I like set the book down. <laughs> he totally did. Because I'm like, how's your book going? He's like, they're having a fight. I had to stop. I, have to, I just have to walk away for a minute. It's so upsetting. Anyway, thankfully, Cole quickly figures out how he can still manage his business empire and live with the man of his dreams. And, you know, the crisis is successfully averted. There's a super, super adorable, sweet epilogue that I particularly enjoyed, showing how Owen and Cole have made things work out. And uh, it may have involved baking and a really adorable puppy. Oh. So I highly <laughs> recommend uh, Fresh Catch by Kate Canterbury. Um, this was part of her primarily... Uh, MF series in, in the Talbot Cove. That's where all of the books are set. Mm -hmm. And usually uh, I kind of approach these kind of uh, books with a little bit of uh, trepidation uh, when a primarily, you know, hetero series has like one book with a, a gay pairing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what it is, uh, but I decided for some reason this past week to give this book a chance, and I'm really glad I did. Kate, if you are listening right now, uh, <laughs> if you write those gay books, I will read them. I love this book so very much. Really quickly, I want to mention there was a secondary plot line where Owen is not only like the strong, silent type, he's also an avid reader. And there's this uh, local woman who owns the bookstore, and she has, you know, she has her eyes set on Owen. And uh, Cole insists that Owen let her down, and there it's a sort of a big confrontation at one point in the book. But towards the end, uh, when our two heroes um, are out on a date at the local bar, they spot her, and uh, she turns some some heads when she leaves the bar with the uh, local sheriff. And this ends up being the setup for the next book in the series. Um, and it's so adorable. And this character, this bookstore owner, she's so interesting and funny that it makes me want to read this next book. Even though I already have a TBR that is a million miles high, I want to give this hetero romance a try because I think Kate does such an exceptional job of creating interesting and compelling characters. So once again, I highly recommend Fresh Catch. Everyone should go read it. Did you know that podcasts love to get reviews too? Taking a moment to leave a review about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast helps us with the show's visibility online. Please take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a review. Your comments help other readers of gay romance discover this show. Thanks for helping us spread the word about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast.
It's always a pleasure to have Jay from Joyfully Jay with us, of course. Her book recommendations are always out of this world. And this time out, we get to talk to her a little bit more than usual because she, like us, is a featured blogger for Coastal Magic. And so we all get together and talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming convention this week and what we're looking forward to. So shall we get to that? Yeah. I'm very happy to welcome Jay back to the podcast. It's great to see you. Hi, guys. How are you? Doing good. good. We're all headed to the beach soon, which is super exciting. <laughs> Very exciting. It is six inches of snow outside my window right now, so I'm super excited to go to Florida. Absolutely. Well, before we get to coastal, and we will talk all things coastal, it, it would not be a visit with you if we didn't get some book recommendations first. Sure. So what are you reading and what's good? All right. So what am I reading? Um, just reviewed Milo by Lily Morton. Um, I think we've talked about her um, books on the podcast in the past, and um, she's become one of my absolute go-to authors. And the second book in her Finding Home series, which is a spinoff of her Mixed Messages series, um, is out called Milo. And such a great, um, she's just such great characters. And this story has a lot of her humor and a lot of the heart that you see in all of her other books, but also just really interesting story, really interesting character development. And um, so I absolutely love that. That review is already up and live, so you can check it out if you've missed, um, if you haven't seen the book. Um, I also just finished Mates by Piper Scott and Virginia Kelly, which is the final book in their, um, I wanna say it's called the Forbidden Desires Trilogy. And this is kind of an interesting one. Um, you really have to be ready to go for it because this is Dragon Shifter, Mpreg-ish in that they're dragons, so they're not really pregnant, but they lay eggs. So there's that whole dynamic, Omegaverse kind of dynamic. Um, but what's really, I think, interesting about the series is the world building surrounding the dragons and um, the politics and the different dragon clans and how they interact is really well done. And this last book really sort of takes the uh, political and the social things that have been happening for the first two books and um, further develop it and expands on it in this last book. And lots of interesting, lots of interesting ways, like just as an example, um, this is a three menage story. So three characters and two of them are both alpha dragons who have been in this secret relationship because two alphas aren't supposed to be together. And then they have this omega and they end up forming a threesome. So there's a lot of discussion on sort of the societal rules about who can be together and who can mate and how the different class structures work. And so I think with, as with a lot of Omegaverse stuff, there's a lot of um, looking at our culture, our society from this sort of fantasy alternate world viewpoint, which I think they do really well here. So plus it's super fun and really sexy and um, fun series. So if you're willing to sort of go for something a little bit more out there, that series is great. I'm intrigued. And then, um, I have to say I'm intrigued yeah, by that. It's interesting. <laughs> you know, I kind of, when I started the first book, I thought like it was going to be just crazy crack fun. Um, and it definitely is. But I was surprised at really the world building really develops. And if you are cool with all of the, you know, Omegaverse, laying eggs, craziness, there's a lot of depth to the books as well. And it builds over the series as we learn more about um, the roles of the Omegas and how it works and sort of some of the backstory. And then they really take it some interesting places in the third book. So um, that series is a lot of fun. Definitely worth checking out. I'll look into that because I know Will's been doing some Omegaverse stuff and I oh, haven't yeah. taken the plunge yet and I'm intrigued by the dragon concept. So Yes, the dragon issue is, is done really well. Like I said, they take the politics and really do some interesting things with it in addition to the sort of, you know, dragon horde, uh, you know, all that sort of typical dragon stuff. So that series I really like. Cool. Um, and it sounds like even though the trilogy wraps up that they might be doing some more set in that world, which I think would be fun. So. And both of those reviewed, uh, were posted last last week. And then this week, um, a couple things just to point out. I'm doing um, Skin and Bones, which is the second in um, T.A. Moore's series. I'm going to forget the name. I want to say it's called The Digging Bones, um, which I love this series because I love the dog. I mean, not only because I love the dog, but I love the dog. This is a series about a canine um, handler who works for the police. 
and you know his job is to find missing people and use the tracker um, and then he's paired with an FBI agent who's assigned to the same community. And in both stories, the bigger picture is that somebody is killed or somebody is missing and they're trying to track down the mystery. So great mystery suspense. Um, but I find the canine dog stuff fascinating. And I really think that um, T. Moore does a great job with just the little details about the commands and how they work and how somebody trains this kind of you know, search and rescue dogs. So that's really fun. And uh, you probably want to start with the first book if you haven't read them, but definitely a fun series. And um, also reviewing this week, um, Only For Us by J.D. Chambers, which is the sixth book in her only Colorado series, which is another fun contemporary, um, just nice banner, light, easy um, stories, often have a little bit of a mild kink, different, um, different kinks for different books. Um, but that's also a lot of fun, and I was really excited because I thought the series was over, and then we got another book, so I was really excited about that one. And that's also going to be uh, releasing this week, so I'll be sure to connect you with links for all of those. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll definitely put all the books in and, of course, link up to the reviews and the show notes as well. And now, now we get to go where our podcast reviews have never, interviews have never gone before <laughs> and actually yeah. talk about something else. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Coastal Magic, of course, is coming up uh, this Really, Thursday through Sunday. Uh, it starts off a little bit on Thursday with a writer's boot camp that we're very excited to attend. Oh, yeah. Are you guys doing that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Damon, like, Damon Swade and Damon Terry Swade Michaels going to gonna teach us some stuff. Yes. Oh, I've heard such wonderful things about their classes. I know that they've taught quite a bit at, um, you know, at other conferences. I've heard great things. So I'm sure it's going to be fabulous. Yeah. Excited about that. Now, I think it's fair to say that between you and Poppy Dennison, you're kind of the driving forces to what has wanted us to go to Coastal for so long. Oh, nice. And now we're, we're taking that plunge. So, I mean, what makes this conference a little different from the other conferences that we're used to going to kind of in our little gay romance genre? Because this is broader than just gay romance. Right, right. So I think they originally started um, as a urban fantasy paranormal romance. And the first year or two, I think that was... Um, most of the authors fit within those genres and hit since expanded, although a lot of the roots are still in those um, in those genres. Um, and I think for me, what is really different about Coastal is it's just a relatively small, very laid back, comfortable conference. And I think it's really accessible, especially for people who haven't gone to a lot of conferences because the size is manageable. Um, and there's a really nice breadth of authors. There's always a nice LGBTQ representation there, but it's not separated off into its own track. Authors are mixed together with all kinds of on all kinds of different panels. And I've always found, as you know, a you know gay romance blogger, that the readers, both attendees at the conference as well as people who come in for the um, signing, are really interested and receptive, even if they're not gay romance readers normally or haven't really been exposed to it before. So I think that it's a really nice, um, just low-key conference. I really think Jennifer, who's the conference coordinator, makes an effort to keep things from being too crazy and things are just sort of nice and low-key and on the beach and you can run on the beach in the morning and be at the conference the rest of the day. And so that really, it just has a nice sort of tone to it, I think. Mm -hmm. What are some tips for the newbies? We're newbies. We know Brew Baker's going to be a newbie this year. Uh, I would say, well, first of all, I would say with any conference, think about what you want to do and plan ahead in terms of looking at your panels and figuring out what things are mo you find most interesting. But also don't make yourself crazy feeling like you have to do something every minute from the very first to the very last. Because I think um, I have definitely experienced that kind of burnout that comes with trying to be someplace every minute of the day. So definitely, you know, take it easy and explore. Um, I would also say there is a big breadth of different authors here. So take the opportunity to try maybe some panels that have authors that you don't know, um, to genres that you may not be familiar with. Um, because for me, definitely when I come here, there is a range of authors that are sort of outside my normal scope of people who I work with regularly through the blog. So I think, you know, getting a chance to try to see some of the other, um, panels and events. And I think also, um, 
you know, this is a, like I said, relatively small. There's a lot of social time and a lot of time where people just hang out. And I think taking advantage of that and not being afraid to go up and talk to people. Um, I know there's some sort of mixer mingle things that are built into the schedule um, that are meant for people to have a chance just to get to know each other and hang out. Um, and then there's always sort of, you know, impromptu lunches and dinners and hanging out at the bar and things like that. And I think getting to, you know, taking advantage of that and just joining in with things, because again, this is just very low key. People are very friendly and welcoming. A lot of the same authors and readers come back year after year. So there is sort of nice camaraderie. And I think just getting involved is good. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the different genres that are represented at this particular convention, um, or conference, I'm sorry. Uh, you you spoke about the urban fantasy origins, and of course, we're going to be there and uh, all about the gay romance. What other genres can uh, people who visit this conference? What can they expect? Sure, I think that there's a little of everything now. Um, definitely, like I said, definitely those two are predominant, but there are tons of you know contemporary authors that are there as well. Um, there's some YA that's mixed into all of that. Um, I mean, I think that you can find a little of everything. You know, the panels just, I mean, even looking at the panels that I'm moderating, things on, you know, doing different types of research. Last year I did one on food in your books, and I think there's a panel again this year, mm -hmm. and cooking and how cooking is incorporated in. And um, so I think that there's a lot of things that are not, genre specific in the panels in addition to some that are very focused you know on gay romance on urban fantasy um a lot of the panels are more about topics that could really take place in any book you know again the food one that could fit in romantic suspense that could fit in historical that could fit you know in fantasy and so i think that there's a nice mix there and that the panels really um cross genres in a lot of ways so it like, gives you a chance to sort of maybe hear some authors that you wouldn't necessarily go to if you were going to a very focused panel and i think that'll help open up the the, the discussion that happens too mm -hmm. just because mm -hmm. everybody will have a slightly different perspective because of their different genres which should be a lot right. of fun yeah yes for sure there's definitely a mix i mean even looking at the panels that i'm moderating i have a big mix of authors and um, genres that they write so what are you looking forward to this year um warm weather uh, I, I i'm joking <laughs> but seriously the first year i signed up for coastal was like a half an hour after the last one ended because while it was happening, we were getting like this huge blizzard. And immediately, like three days later, I emailed Jennifer and I said, I want to come next year. I need to be in Florida in February. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I, I think that I'm, look, I'm looking forward to the, the atmosphere is just nice. I think something about being on the beach just gives everything a really low key um, feeling. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing people again. This is my, I want to say this is my fourth year and um, there's a lot of people that I only get to see at Coastal so I'm really excited about that chance to you know reconnect with people and see people who I don't get to see all year round um, and I'm looking forward to the you know to the panels again and you know not just to moderating but to getting a chance to meet some new authors and um, being exposed to new books last year I found um, new authors that in fact were writing in gay romance that I had never met or were just starting. And so, um, you know, I'm looking forward to see who's out there and what people are, what people are writing and, uh, catching up with everyone. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of panels that I'm, I'm super interested in. There's, there's a flash fiction panel that actually Kieran and Kelly talked to us about on the show a little bit. Yes. And apparently fun. it's awesome. <laughs> super fun. And Kieran and Funny is, is actually usually the closer. It's, you know, this everyone adds a little bit. And she, at least the last one I saw, that was her role. She was the, you know, the one who sort of got it all together. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's a lot of fun. In fact, the first year I didn't know what it was and I didn't go. And I was sitting at a table outside and just talking to people. And I was like, what is happening in there? Because it was like you could hear people laughing from down the hall. <laughs> Um, so then after that, I was sure to go because it's, um, it's a lot of fun for sure. For and sure. there's, there's a romantic suspense panel too, that I'm reading so much more romantic suspense now. Yeah. I'm, yes. I really want to go to see that and hear what all of those authors talk about. Yes. Cause yes, most I of them too, actually, I'm sorry. I said, I have been too, actually, now that you say that a lot more lately. Yeah. 
And there's authors on there that I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't know their work. I know Victoria Sue's in that panel, but there's yes, others that I, I don't know at all. I saw it on here, but. Um, and of course, Cinema Crap Tastique to see yes. exactly what movie is, is Damon Swade going to skewer this year. I know, I know. I was looking to see, because usually Jennifer will tease us a little bit in advance and let us know what he's doing, but I have not heard I haven't any, seen anything. Have you? And I have no. not seen a thing. We will tell the the podcast folks, we'll put on uh, Twitter and Facebook what the movie is, when it starts, and what the hashtags are, so they can do the, the Twitter follow if they want to, because the Twitter traffic yes. gets really insane during that uh, yes. event. Yes, yes, it is. Definitely, for people who are listening, follow along, because Damon will stop at periodic points, and, um, you know, there's constant traffic, both from people in the room tweeting and people online who are tweeting, and then he'll always tell you, you know, this is the time to start again, so you can actually follow along, even when there's breaks in what's happening in the room, you can follow along from home and sort of see the snarky stuff that people are commenting, even if you can't um, hear Damon through the whole thing. So yeah, it's a fun, um, it's a fun event. And what's funny is that this is actually where he started it. It they, He runs, usually he'll do the same movie at RT, uh, Romantic Times Conference, but um, this is where it originated and he carried it over there. So it's sort of funny that it's become such a huge thing from this little conference. But I mean, his hashtags are always trending. There's thousands of people uh, watching. It's really, um, it's really a fun event. Yeah. And nobody skewers it quite like him. It gives the whole oh, no. mystery science theater concept a whole different spin. Yes. <laughs> well, what's funny is he was telling us, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, but like he watched the movie like, 15 times in preparation like this isn't just a off the cuff like he watches it he knows every nuance he knows what's coming in every scene so he really is you know right on top of the humor and what's happening and uh yeah he says you know his poor husband by the time he's done is like we will never watch glitter again you know because <laughs> well, uh, all the time that's the one movie it. i've seen him do was glitter and i'm like yes. i can't imagine watching that like 15 times in enough right, span right, of I time <laughs> Right. I could barely sit through it, even with his commentary, let alone, uh, yes, so uh, lots of fun. That's definitely one worth checking out. And what are you looking forward to, sir? Well, like Jay said, I think it pays not to stress yourself out. I mean, in conferences in the past, I was a little, um, shall we say, uh, regimented in my idea <laughs> of what I wanted to do and what I had to do and when I had to do it. And um, that usually goes out the window in the f <laughs> first five minutes of the conference yes. anyway. So I've sort of like uh, adopted the the mantra of just trying to uh, be in the moment as much as possible and kind of yes. experience whatever the conference has to offer. Yes, I agree. My first time at um, RT was in New Orleans mm -hmm. and um, so there was just a lot happening because, you know, even once the conference ended for the day, you know, New Orleans never sleeps. So there was, you know, 24 hours of stuff going on. But I think I had something on my calendar from like seven in the morning until <laughs> 11 at night, every single time block. And I mean, I needed like three weeks to recover. And after that, I said, I, I refuse to do that because as much as everything is so tempting, now I really try to build in, you know, breaks or times where I'll maybe talk to some authors or interact with people instead of being in a session because if you can make yourself crazy if you you know are too much into your schedule without giving yourself a chance to just really absorb what's happening yeah that's what i'm looking forward to about this conference because like grl in particular just gets crazy with what needs to get done in here Yes, I've got moderator activities and there's some panels I want to see and some other, you know, behind the scenes stuff. But I'm looking forward to like having conversations with people and just yes. hanging out a little bit. <laughs> yes, I'm completely with you. GRL, as much as I love it, is like, it, you know, is work for me. I lead a bunch of things and have so many places I have to be that I sometimes I'm think, like, do I have time to actually attend a panel just for the fun of attending it? And here, definitely, um, I'm looking forward to that chance just to go to things that seem interesting and check them out and not have quite so many obligations. Mm -hmm. 
Now, speaking of schedule, let, let's let's tell people where they can find us during sure. this event because we've all got very specific places we're going to be. And you, your schedule, you talk about the schedule where you're going to kind of be like a little free and easy. You actually are moderating five panels. I, I am moderating five panels. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Yes, I'm moderating five panels. So I think I have... Um, on Friday, it looks like um, We Are Family, which is marriage and kids and family dynamics in your books. And then I have Cast and Crew, also Friday morning, which is Sidekicks and Scooby Gang. So as soon as I saw Scooby Gang, I was all in for that one. So I'm excited about that. Um, and then I'm doing, I think that's it. So that's Friday morning. And then Saturday morning, I'm doing Facts of Fiction, which is research and how authors research and all the things they have to wipe out of their search history. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, sometimes I think these romantic suspense authors have to all be on some sort of FBI watch list. Um, and then actually I'm doing a romantic suspense panel. Now that I'm saying that, I'm doing um, Love on the Run, which is romantic suspense. Oh, fantastic. That's then, the one I want to come to. <laughs> good. Well, come. Yeah, I'm just looking. It looks like great authors. And then I have one more after that. So this is all Saturday morning or Saturday early afternoon, um, Second Nature, which is urban fantasy and shifters. So I have a nice mix, actually, I think, of um, genre-specific stuff and then, um, you know, more sort of topics that span genres. But it looks like most of my stuff is Friday morning or Saturday morning. Nice. You'll be you'll be chilling on Sunday by the time we get I there. I know. I know. I know. Well, what about you guys? What are you guys uh, moderating? So for me, I kick off Friday morning, and I'll be specific on this one. It's going to be Friday morning at 1130 Eastern. It's the Gay Fiction Roundup. Yes. And this features Terry Michaels, Amy Lane, Lucy Lennox, Kiernan Kelly, and Sarah Nichols. And we will be live streaming that on the Big Gay Fiction Podcast Facebook page for folks who may want to tune in and see it. And that's the, the Wi-Fi gods. You know, if they're if they're working for us, we will stream it. And if not, we'll record it and put it up a little later. But that's our intention to let everybody kind of see that panel. Uh, then Saturday in the afternoon, um, they call it moderation. I figure it's more of a hosting kind of thing. There's a contemporary and romance authors meet and greet going on. Yes. Definitely more of a hosting. So yeah, I'll be I'll be meeting and greeting and organizing <laughs> oh, yeah, or something. Tons of authors. I'm just looking at the schedule. There's tons of authors. So it's it should an be an amazing great group. Thing. That's why I was like, I'll take that. There's cool <laughs> yeah, people sure. in that room. <laughs> and then another one that I'm doing on Sunday morning uh, is called Words and Music, and I was really attracted to that one because sometimes I do build playlists for my own books. Mm -hmm. But when I'm sometimes when I'm writing and always when I'm revising, there's just something playing in the background that just helps me kind of right. deal with the words that are on the page. And so I'm like, I'll take that one. And that one actually has uh, Z.A. Maxfield and Amy Lane among its oh, authors. Yeah. So I'm looking super forward to that, too. Yeah. Yeah, what I love playlists. Playlists you know, are good. When there's a playlist that goes with the book. Yeah. Sometimes. I've actually, there's been a couple books that I've actually put out playlists for. Because mm -hmm. I referenced enough music in the book to do that. But otherwise, I just have kind of my own stuff that goes on in the background while I write it. Right. That in may not head. relate to it at all. <laughs> what are you moderating? Um, well, unlike the two of you, I've got a pretty uh, easy breezy schedule <laughs> planned. Um, on Friday morning, I am hosting a panel, uh, Trope Trope Goose. Uh, mm. So we're talking about one of my absolute favorite things in the whole entire world, uh, tropes. Um, yes. I think that panel is pretty much going to run itself because readers and writers have very specific ideas <laughs> of what tropes they Absolutely. love and ones that they don't. Uh, that should be a lot of fun. And then on uh, uh, later later that afternoon, I'm doing a panel called The Sweet Stuff. Uh, I've, there are lots of great uh, authors on that panel as well. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. Awesome. And that's right up your alley because I think you declared earlier this year that you kind of had a sweet guy kink going on. So, oh yeah, that'll work well. And then also on, on Saturday, um, I'm also doing. The, I'm in the public signing. I'm not an official author. Oh but great! The signing gets opened up to other authors who are attending. Yes. And so I'll be signing on Saturday. And if anybody's in the Daytona Beach area, even if you're not going to Coastal, from four to six, the signing's happening, and it's open to the public. Yes, for so. sure. And it does get a lot of traffic from people outside, you know, come in for it. And also just note that this year we're going to have a, a blogger table. So I'm going to have stuff there and I think you guys will as well. Yes. So if folks come in and want to um, check out, I'm going to have some swag and some, 
you know, cards and other things about the blog that you can pick up. And I'll probably be hanging around the table for at least part of the time. So yeah. definitely come by and visit and at least get some goodies while you're there. We highly recommend the Joyfully Jade Chapstick. The lip balm, yes. <laughs> I, I, was say, I thought I had one right here, but I don't. I can't help it. Because yeah. that is some of the best stuff. Yeah. Yes. It's funny. I have had that, not the same, literal same lip balm, but I've had the same lip balms for probably like the last five years. And every year I think I should get new swag and everyone's like, we need your lip balm. So I just keep <laughs> getting it reprinted over and over. And this year we'll be back in Albuquerque for GRL. So like, I absolutely need lip balm um, for that. So the lip balm never goes away. I just keep reprinting more and more. Yeah, between your lip balm and Dream Spinner lip balm, we stay yes. we stay yeah. in the lip well, balm. <laughs> yes. yeah. So cool. Uh, any, any other last words about Coastal Magic you would th throw out to anybody? I don't think so. I think it's just gonna be a fun conference. I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody. Hope the weather's nice for a little walk on the beach. And um, hopefully a lot of folks will either make it there or be able to catch up with some of the online things that you're doing. Yeah, for sure. And we'll have a, a complete rundown on Coastal in next week's show. So great. something to look forward to there. Jay, thank you so much for hanging out with us and talking about Coastal great. and some great books. Yeah, yeah, it was great to see both of you. I don't usually get to see Will, so it was nice to see both of you today. Thanks again so much to Jay for joining us. We're looking forward to seeing everybody at Coastal Magic this upcoming weekend. It starts on uh, Thursday the 28th with that Writer's Boot Camp and then goes through Sunday, March the 3rd. And a reminder once again that we plan to live stream the Gay Fiction Roundup panel discussion that's going to be happening from there. Look for that on our Facebook page Friday, March 1st at 11.30 a.m. Eastern. That's 8.30 Pacific. We hope to see you there. Yes, hopefully we will. Um, I think that'll do it for this week's show. Uh, just a quick question before we leave you. Did you know that the Big Gay Fiction Podcast has its very own Patreon page? Well, we do. <laughs> Patreon is a way for fans to engage with all kinds of artists, writers, musicians, and oh yeah, podcasters too. It's a great way to support the kinds of creative content that you enjoy most. Now, if you're curious about what kind of bonus material we deliver to our fans every single month, just go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Now, coming up next week... We'll be coming to you live from Daytona Beach and the Coastal Magic Convention. We'll have a wrap-up of the weekend, as well as an interview with author Morgan Bryce. Yeah, I'm looking forward, of course, to the convention itself and to get to talk to Morgan. Mm -hmm. So, guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and links to everything discussed in this episode, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday at all major podcast distributors. You can also find us on YouTube. I'm Derek McLean. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>